Hey guys, this is James from Man Tripping, and we are here at another Men Who Blog virtual wine tasting. This time with a awesome San Diego business, a San Diego winery that has a history that goes all the way back to 1850. Now they haven't been making wine for I don't know how many years it is. I can't count because I've been drinking wine today. But anyhow, they have uh, some awesome, awesome stuff, some experimental stuff, some varietals that you're familiar with, and uh, we have sure the people from uh, the ranch that are going to be on here. Blog, and apparently, we have some feedback from uh, from somebody. Awesome but anyhow, San Diego business, a San Diego winery, has a history that goes all the way back to 1850. Now, I'm not sure whose you. mic is going like that. But anyhow, we have three wines we are going to be tasting today. We're going to be starting with the Claret Blanche from Rancho Guajito, which I've been slaughtering the name of. And if you look at it, it's really hard to to pronounce, especially after some wine. But I have had some instruction. We're going to go to the uh, 2014 Rockwood Blanc. Those are both made on property. And Kay Kaylee from the ranch will be talking to, to us more about that in a second. And then we have the 2017 Merlot. And I had this. This just got released, uh, I think, a few weeks ago. It's really, really good. And then not to uh, forget about it, we have this awesome cheese platter that Finissimo Cheese presented for us. It's a pairing platter that has, uh, and I'm going to slaughter these names too, probably, Florette which is a goat cheese from France, Trome Brabus. It's a sheep cheese from France, Schnendelborn. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that one, from uh, Switzerland, and Rustic Red. It's a cow cheese from England. But hey, you know what? Uh, in, instead of me just going on and, and blabbing all this time, I'm going to go and introduce some of the people who are with us today. We have John from uh, Two Dads with Baggage, Ke Kevin from Pub Club, Alexa from 52 Perfect Days, and Katie Dillon from La Jolla Mom. And uh, rather than me talking more, let's uh, kick it to John. And John, tell us a little bit more about uh, about your site, and then we'll kind of go around the horn and end up with Kaylee. So, hey, everybody. Um, I'm John from Two Dads with Baggage. It's at Two Dads with Baggage. And um, we blog about food and travel and lifestyle and our kids um, and all the crazy stuff that raising kids means in today's world. I have two teenage daughters, they're 16 and 18, and one just graduated from high school today, well, this week. So I'll, uh, I'll throw it to Kevin. I'm Kevin with pubclub.com, which is a website about anywhere in the world you can have a drink in your hand. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I have a drink in my hand, and uh, James and I were fortunate enough to have uh, little samples of this outstanding wine a couple weeks ago and I can vouch for it even as I take a few sips here it is outstanding wine so I'm looking forward to doing all the tasting and of course all these great cheeses that we have here too so uh, I'm in the pub club heaven right now cheers <laughs> cheers I guess it's down to me kind of like the Brady Bunch um, my <laughs> name is Katie Dillon and um, I, my website is LaHoyaMom.com. I live in La Jolla. I've got uh, a rescued pit bull and a 13-year-old daughter and a husband. And my website is specializes in you know helping people plan vacations to San Diego. And also, um, I write a lot about theme parks and hotels that I like. So that's a little bit about what I do. It kind of started off as a hobby and turned into a business. And like, here I am drinking, drinking wine and eating cheese with cool people. So all works out. Alexa? Am I up next? Okay. Hi guys. So I'm Alexa Meisler. <clears throat> I have a travel website called 52 Perfect Days. It's a site that shares how to spend a perfect day in locations around the world. I also do a lot of articles that share 52 reasons or tips that you should visit a location. So for anyone who is planning a trip in the future and wants to know some of the best things to do in a location, these are really great articles. I also have a website called Break Into Travel Writing. And this primarily teaches newer travel bloggers um, how to how to fast track their way to making it as a travel writer or blogger. I'm a mom and my son also as John, you just mentioned my son just graduated high school. It's going to be heading off to college. So 
I have no idea what the future is going to hold, but I'm glad to chat with you guys over wine and cheese tonight. Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us. And then I really appreciate the fact that Kaylee is here because without Kaylee and without Adam, who we're we'll be bringing on in a second, there would be no wine for us to uh, to be sampling today. So, Kaylee, thank you for joining us. And uh, yay! Uh, for, oh, for, for, first of all, did I finally pronounce the ranch's name correctly? You, I think you're getting better every time. It's it's good. It's Rancho. So so so, so that's a no, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. I can't even get close. So I, points for trying. No, it's it's a complicated name, but it's easier to remember if you um, if you know the word agua in Spanish means water. So aguajito is like little water. Guajito is a shortening of that word, like a slang. Um, there are other meanings that it could be, but that's one of the options for what the name actually means. So. Rancho Guajito Vineyard. Um, the ranch actually goes back to 1845. Jamesy said 1850, so slight correction <laughs> there, but that's it's easy to remember with the math because you brought up the math. We're in our 175th year of being an operating cattle ranch, which predates California statehood. Um, the original land grant uh, was granted to Jose Maria Orozco by then um, governor of Mexico, Pio, Pio Pico. And it has been held in private ownership ever since and has grown. It is the last intact privately held Mexican land grant in California. Hmm. Um, huh. So it's not just a vineyard, which our oldest vintage is one of the ones you have right now is the 2014. Uh, it's been a cattle ranch for 175 years. Uh, we also practice all organic farming with avocados, uh, citrus. We've got cuties. We're the first USDA certified <laughs> cuties in the United States. So if you're going to McDonald's around here and your kids want to get those cuties as their treat, it's probably from Rancho Guajito. Interesting. Um, yeah, so so we do, we're working on growing and building and we've um, in the last few years really reached out to the community through the tasting room. It's been a great opportunity. Um, my, my job there is marketing and events, which there's been a lot less events lately. <laughs> so I'm happy to be here with you guys um, sharing our wine. So let's see, we grow over 20 varietals of grapes right now, and um, everything is all natural. We don't have any additives, and it's organic by practice. Um, maybe one day USDA certified organic. Right in Escondido, just east of the Safari Park. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think right one, now, one of the things I, that... I'm sorry. But well, as of right now, the, wineries are allowed to open. I'm oh, sorry, James. <laughs> go, go, go on, Kevin. No, I'm sorry. Uh, as of now, as of today in San Diego County, wineries are allowed to open. So are you open now and doing tastings or, or what's the status? <laughs> we are not open now. Uh, today, just today, we set our most official date we've been able to set for two Saturdays from now. So that would be June 27th. Uh, we're just making sure we're super prepared. Uh, we want to make sure we've got the social distancing. We're, at, we're all outdoors, so it should be relatively safe. But again, there's a lot of moving pieces going on and getting our staff back on and all of our wonderful musicians. So that right now will be our date. And then in, until the, your uh, tasting room was open, I would be remiss if I didn't promote the fact that you have an amazing, amazing deal. And honestly, when, when I first found this out a few months ago, I, a couple of us passed it around and said, this can't be right. Have you ever heard of this, this place? A couple of people had, 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 heard of, had heard of you. But I, as good as the deal is, I almost feel like it undermined how good your wine is. Because at ninety nine dollars for a case, the wine couldn't possibly be good, but it was, and and and, and so you know I know a couple people I talked to uh, you know said oh well I don't know if I want to be in the wine tasting with you if, if the wine's not good and I totally understand that so Kaylee sent you know sent me a case and I was like yeah you know this this is really good stuff and especially a local company so don't let the insanely low price uh, dissuade you um, but unlike many other limited time offers. This one will be going away once the uh, once the tasting room reopens, and correct. So we're looking at uh, another week. Is that right? Uh, two weeks from two tomorrow. Weeks? Yep. Two weeks from tomorrow. So they can go to your website and, and order online. Uh, so they can pick your, your favorite wine, and, or not in the tasting today, but tomorrow is National Rosé Day. So uh, I have a bottle of the uh, 2016 Rosé as well, uh, because even though Rosé is marketed towards women usually, I'm a guy, and I like rosé, so gosh darn it, um, <laughs> any guy out there can, can enjoy it too. So, But anyhow, uh, the other thing I was trying to, uh, to interject when, uh, when Kevin and I were, were fighting over the mic 
is that in addition to simply being in San Diego and being on this huge piece of property and being on this old piece of property, unlike a lot of vineyards, you actually have grapes that grow at a huge variation in altitude. I think you were saying from near sea level to 4,000 feet, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So our taste room is at about 200 and something feet above sea level. And then the highest point on our property is just over 4,000 feet of elevation. So to get a scale for how huge this property is, the city of Escondido is 36 square miles. Ranch Guajito is, or 36.1 square miles. Ranch Guajito is 36 square miles. So it pretty much goes all the way from the 78 up to the 76, just about looking right out at eye level with Mount Palomar from the highest elevation on the ranch. So that gives a lot of opportunities for different places to grow all of these grapes that you might not have otherwise be able to find in San Diego County. Cool. Well, I could talk all day. And anybody who's, who's tuned into other shows knows that I have no problem talking all day. But what I would love to do more than talk is to actually try some uh, some of the stuff. So, uh, and apparently, uh, Jonathan is sipping the Rockwood Blanc right now. I'm not. I was waiting for the cue. And uh, this is delicious. Oh, That's a different Jonathan. Oh, a different Jonathan. <laughs> and then uh, oh, Bourbon Blog is also joining hey, us. I'm going to join my friend Jonathan and drink and drink. <laughs> well, let, well let, let me drop, uh, uh, kids, should I, should I drop you off and bring Adam in now? Yeah, last thing I want to say for uh, anyone who hasn't visited us is that we're really family friendly. Um, I think that for especially some of you bloggers who are with us right now, that's important to know that if you're visiting San Diego or you're San Diego, don't hesitate to come out. This isn't your stuffy, normal tasting room. We're a ranch. We are, family is super important to us, just like Jose Maria Roscoe's family was to him back in the day. So when we can, we'll open our hayride tours back up. And we'll there you go. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. so on that note, I think Adam can lead you through the wines um, made by Chris Brumel. Uh, if anyone's familiar with him in San Diego, he's an amazing winemaker. So we'll let him take it away. Sounds good. And then, and for anybody who has questions about the ranch, Kaylee is going to stay on the uh, in the, the back end of the uh, of our chat. So if you have any questions for her, feel free to uh, share them as a comment, and we will bring her back on to answer that. But let's talk about Adam. Hey, Adam, how's it going? Hello. How are you? Can everybody hear Hello. me? Hi, Can Adam. Yep. Cheers, Adam. Cheers. Hi. Hello. It takes a second sometimes for the microphone to work. Can everyone hear me? I can Absolutely. hear you. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Are you able to hear us? Yeah, I got you all. This is perfect. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here and giving me the opportunity to guide you through some of our wines. Um, pretty exciting stuff that we're doing. It's it's sort of off the beaten path for what you would see out here typically. And it's ultimately why I, I joined forces with them and, and came on to their, their crew. I, I, I love the wine so much and they're so um, driven by the environment that they're grown in, which is something that is becoming more common, but was kind of not, not a thing for a while. It was really about big, oaky, heavy wines. Uh, these wines are kind of elegant and more about food pairing and these cheeses are going to go extremely well with it. Uh, but I guess I'll, I'll formally introduce myself a little better. My name is Adam Jesperger. I am a uh, advanced sommelier with the Court of Master Sommeliers, which took me about six years to accomplish. Um, and yeah, I just, I've, I've been involved with hospitality for about seven years and I love what I do. I love wine and it's really taken me pretty far. So I'm, I'm elated to share what I've learned about it with everybody. Um, so yes, James, you were correct with the, the lineup here. We're going to start with the Claret, which is a, a grape that is more commonly seen in the Provence area of France in uh, Mediterranean climate. Um, typically it has a little bit more weight and broad texture to it. Uh, than, than this wine does. Uh, Chris did a really good job of, of pulling the fruit in early enough and maintaining natural acidity in the wine that it's very mouthwatering in character. It's very light and bright and uh, feminine. Um, perfect thing to, you know, poolside hanging out, any kind of chilled shellfish or kind of lighter fare, it's really, really great with. Um, I wanted to do this first uh, with with actually two of the cheeses that we have here, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go over the cheeses really fast, and then I'll go over the wines and just introduce each one, and then tell you what what I think you should pair them with, uh, what I would ideally pair them with. 
but um, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So I, I will say all of these cheeses will probably taste great with all of these wines. But um, to start, we have the Florette, uh, which is a French French cheese, uh, goat cheese, uh, which typically Brie-style cheese like this, these creamier, more buttery cheeses are, are not goat or back in the day, cow. But the goat cheese involved here makes it a little bit tartar, uh, so it pairs a little better with, with some of these more mouth-watering wines. The next one um, is the, called Tomat Brebiche, uh, which I had to clarify that pronunciation. <laughs> James, you butchered that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know the the problem is I I I was almost fluent in French, and then I took Spanish, and then I took Portuguese, and uh, you know I can read stuff. I can tell you what a word means, but I can't pronounce. I can't even pronounce English. That as well. Adam, Adam, say, say that name of the cheese again, Adam. So Tom Ribich. Like, can you hold like it up so we know which one it is? Of an S -H at the end. Um, but uh, so this this cheese is more like into like a manchego style cheese. It has a, a nice nuttiness mm. to the it. The shorter. Which one? Uh, so so here that's the thing. <laughs> I, I hope everybody are are set up the same as my plate is here. This one is what I'm talking about. The Tome Brabisha does this style rind, which is actually very <laughs> edible for more of an earthy. And then the next one is a little bit more rich in color. The, the third, um, the Schnabelhorn, is more rich in, in color. Mm. And uh, wow. the next one is cow's milk. Um, Alpine raised cows in Switzerland. So mm. you're, you're supposed to taste more earth-driven, herbaceous, even grassiness mm. in, in that cheese, which is a pairing heaven for wine. <clears throat> And then on to the final cheese here, the rustic red. This is a cheddar cheese from England. Uh, what's nice about it though, is it has this sort of cave-like, minerally clay-like thing happening with it that, that also makes it really, really a nice pairing. Uh, ideally, I, I, I want to taste this claret with the, the first two. And then I'd like to move into the Rockwood Blanc with actually two and three. And then I think that the the cheddar, the rustic red, will go phenomenally well with the with the Merlot. So <clears throat> the first thing I want to do is go a little bit over like just the basic way that I like to taste wine when I first approach a glass. So a lot of people grab their glass and they start swirling it to death. I do not recommend doing this. I think you should take the wine still and smell it for its initial smell. For me, it's just kind of like crisp, underripe fruit, like pears, yellow apple, green apple, mm -hmm. and, 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 and just, just a little bit of this cheese rind and bread dough kind of character, a yeasty component here, which we'll talk about in a second. So now give it a little swirl, and do this for all the wines uh, it, as we go through it. But give it a little swirl, and you notice a little bit more, like almost like a tropical, more floral element coming out of the wine. It's more like some gardenia and honeysuckle-like smells coming out of the wine now, as well as some herbal stuff. The more you swirl, the more of the secondary and tertiary flavors that are in the wine are going to come out. But it's important to smell it still because there are certain smells that, as you swirl the glass, that you you, you lose because they become overtaken by other smells. So, so, so would you say, is this like a crisp wine? I mean, it just feels so perfect for a summer day. Absolutely. Oh, totally. Crisp, clean, mm. aperitif style wine. The perfect thing to start with. But uh, the reason I want to pair it with the creamy cheese first is because although this wine is crisp, it does have a bit of texture from something called leaves. So as wine is fermenting and the yeast are doing their job and eating up the sugar, as they die, they suspend and fall out of the wine and settle to the bottom. These are called leaves or spent yeast cells. And they actually contribute a lot of flavor to wine and texture. So this wine is a leaves-driven wine. It was aged on its leaves for a good amount of time. At least it definitely tastes more leavey than, you know, if it wasn't aged on its leaves, I'd be shocked. But I'm, I'm certain that it was. Uh, they, the other thing they do sometimes is they stir the leaves. I'm, I can't tell if Chris did that or not on this vintage. But um, I actually think it just rested on the leaves 
and then was just drained off. But um, so that contributes this cheese rind, bread dough, sourdough bread starter, um, and all those yeasties that we call it autolytic aromas and flavors. So that makes it obviously a cheese pairing wine for sure. Um, and, and the thing that's really nice about this is that crisp finish, that exactly what Alexa was saying, how it's a crisp summer wine, it, it, it has a good amount of mouthwatering character. So the way that we detect acidity in wine, which I, I like to refer to it more as mouthwatering character to be more food friendly, but ultimately that is what it is, is acidity. Some people cringe at the thought of acid, but it's very, very important in wine. So the way that I like to measure acidity is by taking a sip and then just tilt your head forward and close your lips and measure, like sort of use your, your lips as a well, as a reservoir that fills up with your saliva. And the more of that that's happening, the higher acidity that's in the wine. And that drives the finish, that drives the flavor, and it also really wakes your palate up and makes you ready for bites of food. So let's try the floret with some of this beautiful claret. I like to taste the wine first, have some of the cheese, and then taste the wine again. Two for one. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> and then you know what you can do after that? Another bite of food, and then more wine. <laughs> That's what I've been doing, and I'm almost feeling we'll be doing that. <laughs> now, Adam, we, we had a question from Sci-Fi Guy one on on uh, YouTube. He's asking which of these, mm. which of the grapes we're tasting tonight are most native to the San Diego area. Um, none of them would be native to San Diego, but as far as something that you would more commonly see uh, vinified here and produced here would be the Merlot, by far. Um, so it's well. Let me just confirm on the Rockwood Blanc. Yeah, there's none in here. So even the stuff in the Rockwood Blanc, the, so we'll get to that in the blend there in a minute. But everything here, uh, most of what Rancho Cojito is doing, they're, they're experimenting with varietals from all over the place. But most Vinif vinifera grapes, or the actual species of, of grapes that are most typically vinified, are indigenous to France. A lot of stuff that we see that is kind of bounced around the world uh, a lot of it that, that, that is more mainstream came from France. There are tons of indigenous varietals elsewhere, like especially in Italy alone, there are 3,000 plus varietals indigenous to Italy, but oh. it was just insane to think about. But um, th so no, the answer would be none, but the stuff that I would see that would be most commonly produced in San Diego area or up in San Pasquale Valley or even up in Temecula or a little north of there would be Merlot for sure. Okay. And so, Mike Allen, thank you. You commented just as I was about to click on uh, on Ashley, but uh, Mike, thanks for joining us. Um, Ashley, who I'm assuming that you probably know, um, says yeah. that he, she doesn't think that he stirred the leaves. Right. Well, that, that, that process is also called batonage. And I, I remember asking Chris about this, but I, I, I specifically think that he didn't. I think that it just aged on him. But it is a leaves-driven wine, and it does have that flavor. One thing that might have happened if he did stir them is it might have more color from doing that because it does oxidize the wine a bit more, but that makes it a little bit um, less ageable. So this wine could actually age a little bit longer due to the fact that he didn't do that. So maybe that's what he was going for. I, 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 I absolutely love this wine. I, I, I appreciate that Alicia actually wrote Lee's because Adam, the whole time, I've been thinking you were saying leaves Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm no, like, like uh, that, 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 that doesn't sound to me. No, 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 no. They're, they're just so, they're dead yeast cells. They're yeast cells that, that stop eating sugar. That's all they are. So but, okay, um, they, they contribute a lot <laughs> to the wine. Um, so well, I don't know what any of that means, but this is an outstanding wine. I mean, yeah, I agree. Favorite it is very good. They produce. I, I think it drinks very Chablis like. It reminds me of a Chardonnay from northern burgundy it's very crisp very clean unoaked and and you know just great the way it is just right now with anything just even by itself outside in the sun i would love that should but, we be uh, having any <clears throat> of the dried fruit or cornichon so, with this so wine? The, the, is they actually put together like 
perfect things to, to pair even individually or, you know, you can mix everything up like you would typically. But since this wine does have that sort of laziness and that like yeasty bread dough like character, even just bees on their own with it are kind of amazing. Um, as well as like, you know, the, the um, sultanas or the dried white grapes here. Not, not a bad pairing at all. Cornichons have that bright, oh, that kind of <laughs> vinegary. I like it. And, 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 so, and so apparently I was right by saying that uh, Alicia um, must be somebody associated with the ranch because apparently um, she's the winemaker's wife. Yes, she is. <laughs> they, they make wine. They make a lot of wine and they are extremely experienced. And I'm, I'm very thrilled to be working with them and learning a little bit more about what they do. Um, I love the natural approach to winemaking that they take. Uh, it, it, they, they are in no rush to release wine before it's ready. It's it's really not about selling wine just to get money for it. They they want wine to to be showcased the way that, that that it's supposed to be. So I really appreciate that, and that that goes right with this next wine that we're about to have from the first vintage, 2014. Uh huh. <laughs> All right, I see the. <laughs> Well, I, but, I had uh, never had a Claret before, and I, you know, when um, you kindly sent the uh, samples down, and James kindly enough to uh, gave some to me. But the Claret was just, it just outstanding. I'm just really impressed, and I think I'll be sophisticated when I go to uh, sit out at one of my bucket list items at the Tour de France. I'm sitting mm -hmm. on a uh, a little village, having some wine, and the bicyclers go by. Then I get on my bike and meet them at the next village. I'll just act real sophisticated and say. Yes, do you have a nice claret, please? <laughs> <laughs> it almost looks like a cider. Are you talking about uh, wine number two? The, yes. Uh, Wood Blanc. So Alexa we're jumped ahead on us. <laughs> so Sorry. So this is. This I'm is, excited. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Move into that, I'm not ready to go. Take, oh. take a bite of the second. You can, you can double, you know, double fist. It's fine. Of, yeah. course. of course. That's true. Mm -hmm. But I, I would like to ask the, the tone for <laughs> With, so we're gonna with so, wine so wine. we can try the tome. Yeah, try the tome berbiche with with the first one. Wait, wait, what? The so the second cheese here, the tome berbiche. I would like you to taste that with with wine one. Okay. And and John, you're making Heather laugh. <laughs> well, are we back it up now? Maybe you have two glasses, so it's perfect. You can go back and forth. I have no shame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I have them in three different glasses in front of me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to rush anybody. I well, I guarantee this Clorette's not surviving the evening here in Pub Club World Headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's delicious. <laughs> and right about now, good. now, Kaylee's sitting there going, oh, my God, Ooh, I <laughs> greenlighted all these people? What are we doing here? <laughs> well, I, so I, I like this I like this tome. It's got a kind of a little, little more crystalline, uh, like a light yep. crystals on it. Yep, I like those crystals. The I think that has to do with amino acids somehow. But they're 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 one of my favorite things, like in Gruyere and Manchego cheese, which this this imitates Manchego to me a lot. Has a really yeah, good I agree. nutty, like hazelnut almost kind mm. of character. Yeah, I love those crystals in any kind of cheese. It just that little crunch. That texture, really. Makes it. Okay, well let's move into the second wine here, the Rockwood Blanc. Um, first, I'm going to talk about orange wine. So that's you're noticing that that sort ah. of uh, deep concentration and mm. color. So this wine was made basically the same way that you make a red wine. They they macerate the juice on the skins for a, a decent amount of time. I believe it's 21 days for this wine. Um, I'm not 100 percent on that, but I, I think it's it's that amount of time. Um, so that contributes a lot of things to the wine. It contributes texture. <laughs> It oxidizes the wine a little more, so it gets more of this sort of baked fruit character. Um, and it just adds a really broad texture and, and, and really like dries out the fruit character. Um, this winemaking technique uh, goes back 5,000 plus years. So in the Caucasus Mountains, which is now technically the, the country of Georgia, which is in between the, the, the Baltic Sea and uh, the, I forget the other sea right there, but it's where Asia meets Europe. And Not to be confused with the state where I used to live. 
<laughs> oh, no, not not Georgia, the state. Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> common common thing people think, but um, th this this style of winemaking goes back so far, and it it basically what they used to do is they would take a clay vessel called a beverage or every I think, and it they would just take whole grapes, whole clusters throw them in this vat and bury them underground and come back later and see what happens. And that was like one of the earliest styles of winemaking. And they would do that with white grapes and pull up what, what, you know, whether it would be months or even years that they would leave this, this, this vessel underground. They'd pull out this one wine that had, that had this very amber color um, and, and almost orange in nature, uh, very gold. And now this winemaking technique is, it's been emulated in, in many other places. A lot of fam famous producers in Italy and, and other places in the world, uh, especially like Gravner and Radicon, are becoming very well. Already are very famous for the style of winemaking, um, but it's catching on, and and it, it's it's being done more and more in the new world. And they're, they're incredible wines to to pair with all different styles of food. You could take this wine all the way from the beginning of a of a you know a meal, a multi course meal all the way to the end, even into like a pork dish or something that has like a caramelized onion mustard sauce or something like that would be mm -hmm. good with just wine. But um, uh, let's talk a little bit about like the fruit notes that you would get. So let's do the same thing, we'll smell it still. Instantly, it just has this like honeyed character to it, this, this baked character to the fruit. These dried apricots are almost the perfect pairing on their own. Oh yeah. It, it it had this sense of caramel, the caramel. right caramelization, mm. honey that that comes with some of the oxidation that's happening at this point. So the the fact that oxygen is that plant here, that it bakes out the fruit a little bit, it caramelizes the fruit a little bit. Imagine just setting an apple that you sliced out on the counter and then coming back, you know, ten hours later, it would be like kind of browned and have a little bit different flavor and smell to it. That that's being uh, showcased here. So I, I, initially, I get that 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 <clears throat> baked like marmalade like character, yeah. and uh, as well as like a little bit more of an earth driven tone here. It's not so much. It does have some floral stuff, but more like dried potpourri or like orange blossom kind of stuff. But there's this like like fresh hay like character and like organic earth tone to this wine that I think makes it really special. Yeah, it almost has like a dryness like you would expect in a red. Right, exactly. And and that's the other thing that does get contributed to the palate is uh, like, like tannic structure, like you would get out of a red wine, that sort of drying yeah. sensation. And like you have like little little bits of like chalk dust or something in your mouth. Uh, it adds a really serious textural element. And that's what makes it really nicely paired with fatty meats or cheeses, anything that contributes uh -huh. that sort of creamy texture. And, and Sci-Fi Guy says he's... Tasting a lot of uh, a lot of yeastiness. There's, there's a lot of yeastiness in this, kind of, in, 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 a, in a bready, in a good way. Oh, I know yeah. yeastiness yeah. can can kind of go either way, but uh, thank you, Sci-Fi Guy One, for ever clarifying that one. Yeah, I can see how it could go with like a meat because it, it does have a heavier um, body to it. I guess it's it's not light and crisp like the first one, like the right, right, you know, much the blanc, much yeah. bigger fuller body it's much yeah. more textural when you think about um like body and texture one of the ways that we try to measure is that is by not uh, trying to think of like different grades of milk versus water so like oh. the would be much closer to like water or skim milk in texture this would be closer to like a two or two percent or a whole milk oh. and then okay. stuff gets so heavy and thick that you you associate it with like heavy cream I've never no. heard that analogy before. Yeah, but that's Me a great analogy. That yeah. Was a really great yeah. analogy. Of the flavor of milk, just the texture, just the Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, Sci-Fi Guy 1 has another question. That's what role sure, does non-filtering play in the taste? So not filtering the wine. So as far as like affecting the flavor, it, it, it so when they filter the wine, it, it's more about appearance um, and, and like clarification and things like that for finding and filtration. Um, I think ultimately that that process can change the flavor of the wine just by oxidizing the wine or, or, or just having to, to take the wine through through more turmoil before it gets released. I think that not filtering the wine 
I, I can't speak to whether or not that changes the flavor too dramatically because I've never had one producer give me an example of a wine that they chose to filter and then not filter. But I do know that most natural wines, if not all natural wines, are unfined and unfiltered. Um, and they, they have this more um, natural, sometimes earth-driven, less like polished fruit character to them, more like tart. Uh, earth-driven notes are, are more present in the wine, d depending on what it is and where it's from. It's a difficult question to answer. It's a great question. Adam, I'm glad you explained the non-filtering. I agree. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I poured this wine, and this is me like that doesn't know shit. Sure. But I poured the wine and I'm like, oh, oh crap, something's wrong. And so I literally went off camera to taste it <laughs> to make sure, <laughs> make sure I was like, oh shit, I got a cork bottle. So, but thank you for explaining. You know what it looks like, John? It looks like one of those uh, uh, craft beers, like the uh, yeah, yeah, like the hazy IPA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. hazy yeah. IPA. That's I, what I, it yeah. looks like. It does. Yeah. And I keep, yeah, yeah. I keep expecting to see like some a little foam on the top of it, but right. I don't know if I've ever seen a wine this color. So it's a little mentally confusing. I've never, I've never seen it. It even can have a sour beer kind of like character in a lot of orange wines. This they do a good job of, of not making it seem too beer like. Um, I, I think this wine still drinks very much like wine. So this would be a great wine for beer lovers. And, and ah, that's a good point. That's yeah, a great point. So, yeah. So for people that love beer but haven't really gotten into wine yet, this would be a great transition I think this to good getting into wine. That, that's a great. It's very great smooth. Point. Right, awesome. and the texture is what I love about this. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder if you can even pair it with some different breads too, like you know, leveraging the the yeast and the, and the bread like nature of the wine, but pairing it with say a, a sourdough versus a pumpernickel or something like that. To... Sure. I think that'd be a really fun thing to do. I've never I've never done a just like a strict bread pairing. That would be. Well, John, cool. we'll, we'll go pick up some uh, stuff from Bread and See, and we'll meet you up there in, in in two weeks when you guys open. So. That'd be great. <laughs> so, Let's do it. That's a great idea. One other thing I wanted to mention about this wine is its sort of herbaceousness that it has. We talked about like the fresh hay-like character, but there's also sort of like a, a dried like bay leaf kind of thing here, or, or even like a curry leaf. And that is what I wanted to take us into the Schnabelhorn, the, the, uh, the, the cow's milk Swiss cheese that we have here that is not Swiss cheese, but from Switzerland. Uh, alpine raised cows, so there's supposed to be a more herbaceous character to this cheese, more grassy, more herbal, and I think that's what makes it go really mm. well with, with this wine in particular. Um, but I gotta be honest, I, I tasted some of the cheddar with this wine, and that was not a slouch pairing at all either. So I, I, I think that this wine technically could go with pretty much every cheese on this plate, but um, I think I think that Schnabelhorn is really nice with it. I have a little input on Swiss wines from my grateful uh, Swiss press trips I've been on. The wines are different because the cows are uh, at such a high altitude when they're grazing in the Alps. Yep. So, so, so all their cheeses taste uh, completely different than anywhere else you meet in the world. And they yep. have some outstanding, outstanding cheeses in Switzerland. They make some outstanding wine at those high elevations too. They make great wine in Switzerland, very underrated. I don't, and Absolutely. they only export ten percent of it, and that's usually just across the border. Uh, and their wines are outstanding. The white wines are absolutely just so smooth and so nice and easy, almost like your claret. So right. Switzerland, yeah, exactly. they they make um, a lot of different stuff that that would be similar in style. They're they're at high elevation, very cool climate. Uh, their, their regions, I believe, are called cantons, and there are two that are really famous called Zaud and Valais. Uh, B-A-L-A-I-S, I believe, is what, what the other region is called. And they make really crisp, clean whites. And I, I love those wines a lot. They make fantastic Chardonnay. They make, they make a lot of they make great red wines as well. Um, but, yeah, so this cheese is pretty darn delicious. Mm -hmm. Did yeah, just, just want to give a shout out to the, the Venisimo, the Venisimo guys. So for those of you who, mm -hmm. who got the uh, tasting uh, platter, uh, you guys already know how great Venisimo is. They did a really, really good job pairing here, and I know John and I have been customers for probably way more than we should probably healthfully Years. be eating cheese. But uh, 
Uh, they're in San Diego. They've got locations in Mission Hills. Uh, they got a location in Delmar. They got one down at the Liberty Station. Mm-hmm. I feel like they have another location too. But uh, for any any of you who have been there, like, oh well, I, I like cheddar. Okay, well that's great. Go in there once they once they fully open back up again. Go in there and say I like cheddar, and they will walk you through finding the cheddar that's exactly right for you. These guys are insanely good at what they do. And uh, while we can't do tasting the way we used to do tasting six or eight months ago. Um, they do a great job just, uh, you know, over the phone and email by, you know, letting you kind of walk through the different options there. So thank you very much for the Nisimo guys for being a part of this, uh, even if you weren't also, able to uh, be on the show. They, 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 uh, I used to work at a, at a wine bar at the Liberty Public Market down here, and they, they, had a, they still have a spot in there. Uh, and I've, I've just always loved their cheese. So I've been, I've been pairing wine with their cheese for about five years, to be honest with you. Awesome, they, and then yeah, and then the best sorry. collection in San Diego by far, and their their staff are extremely helpful. Katie, um, any other questions oh. about wine here, the Rockwood Blanc? Mm-hmm. Should we move in? I was just going to say about Venissimo real quick though. Their presentation is beautiful always, mm-hmm. so you can literally go in there and you can pick out the cheese, and they will zhuzh it up. You know, so you can just. <laughs> can you spell that word, please? Serve it. No, I cannot. <laughs> and while I've been, to be honest, until this week or last week, I had no idea that they actually did cheese platters. And I, oh, I knew yeah. you could go in They're there and get amazing. like a you know, like a two hundred dollar you know um, board for an event for catering. But uh, th- this board they put together for us today, you can actually say you know go in the. I think it's a ten dollar board that's two cheeses or three cheeses, and the twenty dollar board is four cheeses. And that's a normal thing. You can just go in there and say, you know, put that's me, a deal. Put, yeah, for what you get. So, anyhow, supporting local businesses, I I love that. I know a lot of you guys aren't necessarily here in San Diego, but uh, uh, find local places like that to do a great job because mm-hmm. it's always great when you can actually walk in there and talk to people that actually are invested in what they're doing. And get your kids started early, because I took my kids to the museum that we would stop in. And they would get samples of cheese on a toothpick, and they called them cheese popsicles. But <laughs> no, really. But yeah. now, um, when we have cheese at home, they can tell you, "Oh, that's Midnight Moon." Oh, okay. That's. I mean, they like they know. So get your kids started early, and you'll. Oh you'll yeah, my daughter is all about the stinky cheese. The stinky oh. cheese, yeah. <laughs> yes, and we would have after have after school like cheese platters. So. <laughs> it's an expensive it hobby for though. me. Yeah. Well, is, you, you can mix in Trader Joe's and, you know. And actually, all, Aldi does a great job on, on uh, very budget-level cheeses that are not, not bad. So yeah. we like to use that as well. But anyhow... Uh, anyway, back to the wine. <laughs> yes. yes. After the these wine. messages. So let's move into this new release, the Merlot. So this is fruit that we source uh, from the Santa Barbara region from the subregion of San Inez, which is an ABA. Um, I, I, I don't- Which is a what? Say that again. What, what is it you just referred to? It's an to ABA, an American viticultural, uh, so, so it's an American viticultural area. So it's something that you have to apply for to be designated <laughs> as such. We're, we're currently applying to make the San Pasqual Valley an ABA. It's a very arduous, lengthy process, but um, we're, we're trying to do that. All I'm saying is it's from a specific subregion within Santa Barbara Valley. So, and, that, and that's an official thing with the government, actually. It's, it's not just something that some trade right. group made up it, to charge money. It's actually a, uh, I think it's right. FDA or... Right, and yes. FDA approved to be put on labels. So And, and here's, a, here's a fun fact is the actual, the first AVA was in Missouri. That's true, Augusta, Missouri. Which is totally mind-blowing for those folks who think of California and Oregon and Washington as the only wine areas, but... Uh, it was I think, six months later that Napa um, got got uh, added or something. Yep, it was so, Napa, then I believe Sonoma. Yeah. So. And so, what will that do for you if you got the ABA certification? Like, what other would, than that, you could put it on the bottles. Like, uh, it, it also would just draw attention to our region. So, when people went to study wine of the world in general, it would be a bigger inclusion in in, in what they're looking for. So. It, as of right now, pe- people don't really think of, of San Diego as a, a major wine region. We are up and coming for sure. Um, and, and I think a lot of people associate the wine that we make with a lot of Temecula wine, which I, I haven't had a ton of Temecula wine, but the stuff I've had has been pretty um, 
like like big and rich and 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 doesn't really have a ton of like mouthwatering character not a lot of like pep to it just kind of oaky fruity wine which is what i really loved about rancho pajito is that they, it's, it's more about elegance and tasting where the wine is from which is something that that this merlot does really really well james and i had on Dafa winery from temecula a couple Dofo. weeks ago on our first dofo dofo uh winery from our um, on our virtual happy hour show and they gave us two wines and they were they were outstanding they were both red wines oh. they were outstanding wines i mean just ab absolutely fantastic uh, they didn't survive the night either after that show by the way <laughs> yeah, adam i'd be happy to introduce you to damien if you'd like uh, he's he's an awesome awesome guy he's their uh, the winemaker I'd love to check out like some some people that are doing things more on the reserve side in that region. I've only had very, like I said, very few wines from there, so I'm not trying to stereotype them or, or or say as a general rule that that's how the wines are. I'm sure that there are people that are that are crafting incredible wines there. I just haven't had them yet, so I look. No, and, and and I think you're. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert by any means, but I've I've explored enough to um to at least make an opinion, and I, I'd say that. The, there are some excellent wines up there, but I, I would agree that it definitely lends itself more towards the big, bold, heavier wines, that, that, you know, the cabs and the... Uh, right. and the I don't know if I've really had more lows up there, but uh, there are a few that, that do some lighter stuff, but it's, it's mostly the... I think that's because they're trying to compete with Napa. I mean, 10, year, t 10 years ago, Temecula was, was honestly was nothing. It was just a bunch of guys that, that had vineyards, and I think today they are... You know, people from L.A. and Orange County that are going to either fly up to Napa or they're going to drive to uh, Temecula, and that's what they're catering towards, and they're doing a good job at it. I, I think it's it's definitely grown, even in the short time that I've been involved in the world of wine. You know, six, seven years, I've only heard more and more about them. So, Let's see if I can um, you get that right, center please. for you. So there's there's a photo of them. Oh, cool. And then Sci-Fi sci Guy has, has another question, and I think the answer, um, I'll let you figure it out. So he says he's a bit confused. The, mar the more lower tasting is from Rancho Ojito or uh, from, uh, from another region. So, so we grow a lot of our own fruit, and then we source some of our fruit. So this Merlot is sourced fruit from Santa Barbara up north of us. Uh, so this, this Merlot came from the Santa Inez Valley, uh, which is within Santa Barbara uh, County. So it, it is sourced fruit, but um, most of the wines that we produce are from local fruit from the ranch. So the first two wines that we tasted were all fruit from the ranch, and then this is the only bottle that we're tasting that is sourced fruit. And he's also asking about letting it open up. I know for that, that's a question that a lot of people have is really how do you – there's a lot of people selling aerators and, and different things. Right. But, uh, I'd, I'd love to answer that. I'm going to explain what is called a splashed can't. So it's the most ugly version of decanting, the least elegant looking way to do it. But basically you would take a decanter that has a, a wide enough top that you can just flip the bottle literally upside down so that glug, 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 you're getting as much air into that wine as possible. That's step one. Then tasting the wine right after you did that and then giving it time to evolve is always you know a, a treat for me but sometimes people don't like the way a wine starts out and then a little bit later they start to like it more so with this merlot being a young wine i i think plastic canting it would be a, a great option because i think that with time and with air it does start to uh open up a lot and and showcase more fruit forwardness what did you call that again blast decanting splash like just splash splash splash, splash. Okay. <laughs> like, Splash and water, and how much air is getting in there. With and the, the least, got it. And then Alicia spot. added, adding about the Merlot. Thank Alicia you. was adding that it's an opportunity to get great, some great fruit and make the Merlot until the Merlot at the ranch is ready. Uh, uh, yeah, prepared. so that's the thing is, we have a lot, since we're still experimenting and we've planted a lot of things, you know, recently, whether it's been within the past year, or within the past three or five years, it's it takes a certain amount of time before you can actually produce wine from the fruit. I think it takes three years before you can actually have suitable fruit to produce wine with. From there, to, you know, you, you move into adult and then mature vines, which there's there's a peak for production. And then as vines mature and get older, they produce less and less, but more concentrated fruit a lot of the time. So the, the age of the vines is, is very important. But they, they wanted to experiment with Merlot and found really good fruit. And 
it, you know, it's giving them the practice that they need with that varietal before we, we make our own. So I, I think it's a terrific wine, though. Um, and then just, just to uh, also add on, Kaylee uh, sent me notes saying that Rancho Wajito is already uh, is, is working to become their own AVA. San Pasqual Valley already is one. Oh, really? So San Pasqual has AVA certification. I did not know that. So we're trying to become Rancho Wajito AVA. That, that's, that? what, that's what she's saying. And, and, and then th those of you guys who are watching, just kind of back up what Adam was saying, too. Um, you know, estate wines are, are wonderful. But I think there's, there's a lot of, I would say probably most at this point, most wineries, aside from the ones that are exclusively a state, are using juice in some way from a lot of different places, whether mm -hmm. it's from blending or whether it's from, and so the fact that, that you guys are buying juice from somebody else should not be looked down upon because ultimately it, it's the winemaker that's crafting the expression that is uh, perhaps the most important element of uh, of that equation. Absolutely. Some some of the most famous winemakers in the world are using sourced fruit. So it's there's there's no nothing about the winemaking or, or the production that makes it any more of like a slouch wine because we, we got the fruit from somewhere else. There there's no issue with that. Um, it, it's it's it, it, it doesn't degrade the wine whatsoever. Some of the best wine in the world is um, but this this Merlot it does kind of capture more of that uh, region's character it's it's like light and bright for merlot a lot of merlot exactly here comes heather saying how it's not as heavy as others it's more red fruited it's more herbaceous and 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 earthy and kind of funky there's no oak on this merlot a lot of people oak their merlot uh which which isn't necessarily a bad or a good thing i i i never had an unoaked merlot until i tasted this but it reminds me of Cab Franc from Loire in France a little bit. It kind of has mm. this homage to the old world. It, it, it's very uh, like tart red fruit, like cranberry, raspberry, red currant. And then there's almost like tobacco and, and like, like, like bell pepper character here. So the thing that's important to know about all grapes is they all have certain impact compounds. So these are things that are aromas that you can find in all different things in life. So not to make it too nerdy here, I'll make it more user friendly <laughs> at the end of this, but there, there's a certain compound called pyrazines or methoxypyrazines is the long term for it. And it's what's responsible for the smell in, in jalapeno, serrano, bell pepper. And methoxypyrazines are present in uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Carmenere, Petit Verdot, even a little bit in Malbec and some other varietals, Cabernet Franc, big time. But this Merlot, since it's, and, and you really get more of that herbal pepper kind of character in less of a ripe wine. If, if it's a super ripe, flashy, fruity wine, it, those, those earthier, kind of funkier notes drop off. So what's really nice about this is it's like a thought-provoking wine. It's almost like every time you pick up this glass, it smells like something new. I, that, that's my favorite thing about this wine. And that, I think, also has to do with uh, what, what someone else was saying that commented earlier about it opening up with time. I, I think mm. the, the, the wine is just changing constantly. I'd be really curious to see what this wine does in five or ten years from now because it has the ability to age that way. So, and, and, and then for those of you who are, who are newer to and, and this is – I'm kind of on the edge of being the newbie, but a whole new world in front of me kind of seeing things. So the, the wine will continue to age in the bottle, but it's different than if it was continuing to age in the, in the barrel. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. So if you're using a barrel, it's coming in contact with wood, right? So if it's a new barrel, there are a lot of things loaded into this wood called lactones, and they come out into the wine time, and they contribute a lot of flavor, uh, like vanilla uh if it's if it's french oak more like baking spices like like cinnamon nutmeg cardamom brown sugar creme brulee kind of flavors all that really expensive napa cab a lot of them have a brand new expensive french oak that, that really contributes a lot of those flavors american new oak contributes a little more of like a coconut dill character along with some vanilla and then there are other like Hungarian, Slovenian styles of oak that people use that, that are somewhere in the middle. But um, neutral oak and new oak both contribute oxidation to the wine. So if you aged a wine in barrel for too long, it would mm -hmm. oxidize too much and potentially become more port-like than anything and not really 
like still have the character that that most people would be going for with a wine. So it, uh, some people age in oak for a really really long time, especially with with certain varietals that that handle it. But there are certain certain grapes that you really don't want to dominate with oak that way. Um, uh, oak is considered used after it's been used oak after it's been used three times. So it's no longer contributing all these vanilla, cinnamon, creme brulee like flavors. It's more about um, like cedar and and like walnut, praline, more oxidative baked character, and just adding that that little bit of cedar tone to the wine. I have well, to I'm say, a, I, I love hearing sommeliers talk about wine because it's like this cross between the world of science and poetry, and it's okay. beautiful to hear. <laughs> appreciate well put. that. I appreciate that. Sounds really nice. I'm, I'm uh, impressed. I'm impressed how you got so much flavor out of this wine, but yet being so light. Right. You know, I'm. I'm not sure I've ever had a red wine that way because usually the lighter ones, uh, you know, lack on flavor. But somehow it's got a nice uh, uh, combination, and I'm. It's great. I love Cheers. it. It's like, Cheers. It this, Cheers. Like, wonderful, like dustiness and then Cheers. tart, and then it's very generous with the fruit. I agree. It's delicious. And now, with the rustic red cheese, what do we think? Ooh. Of that? I think rustic. I like it. I've been nibbling on that with this wine too. <laughs> too. To be honest, I've been nibbling all of the cheeses with all of the wine. <laughs> but I think that's to be expected. Oh my gosh, the blonde is mm. watching. She's from Monterey County, which is a great and wine growing area. And where did come oh, yeah. play with cheese? Santa Lucia Highlands. Mm, the rustic reds are really good. I my wine. favorite is the Schnabelhorn. By the way, it cheers to everyone watching. I don't know if you heard me or not, but my friend They're the Blonde delicious. is watching from Monterey County, which is a great wine so good. area. I love mm -hmm. going up there too. So cheers to everyone watching. Cheers. Cheers and thank you everybody for, for being involved and allowing me to talk about wines. My favorite thing in the world. And then Kaylee also is uh, reminding me. Uh, she said, "I forgot that we should have. We should also thank Staley Grove, who's the manager of growing and harvesting all of all the grapes." So, uh, I don't is that know Staley how. Farms is that like the same people as Staley Farms, Kaylee? I have no idea. Sure Maybe. It's fine. Sure it's fine. <clears throat> um, I can't speak to. I don't know. I used to get a farm box. Oh, sorry. It's Al, Al Staley. Stay. Staley, sorry, my my uh, my screen is itty bitty when I'm uh, on here, so I can't exactly see things as, as well. But uh, I, I would imagine that it's got to be probably related. That there can't be that many farmers in North County that have the same last name without being related. <laughs> well, when James said we're going to be doing this and their wines from Escondido, you know, my first thought, and I'm glad he mentioned this earlier at the start of the show, I was like, oh God, those things are going to be really bad. But I'm telling you what, I was so impressed with all the wines that we've had. We had one, I believe you said uh, uh, six of them before. And Can we do this uh, every night? Yeah, I know. But these wines are outstanding. Yeah. It just blew me away. I like. I couldn't believe it, you know? And here it is, they're offering this great deal. I mean, it almost seems like you're, um, it, 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 like, what? Wake me up, really? Because these the, wines the, are really, really good. The wines it's, drink they punch way above that weight class and they, hmm. they the only reason I like that line. I'm gonna steal that sometime. I'll give you credit. Well, I'll, I'll give you credit though. <laughs> I've been using that on the floor for a long time. Are you a sports guy too, like me? <laughs> Not so much, but it, it works for it. But um, they I think the, the pricing is more about trying to be compassionate during this time and and you know, help people out so that they can relax and drink some wine during this time of turmoil mm -hmm. that we've all been going through. So I really really appreciate what they're doing but that that pricing is not typical we're we're pretty competitive with some of the people that are producing the most elite elite juice in this region so i i it's i was shocked to see the pricing that we were doing on these wines um after only being with them a short while and knowing what we typically sell them all individually for it's it's an absolute like bonkers steal so um yeah not not something you would typically associate uh in that like level of class for this for, for, what what would you say with like an average pr 
price if somebody wants about, to about twenty five to thirty five dollars depending that's on not uh, for this quality wine, wine that's a very good yeah. price. yeah right i, I agree I, I, once they get the AVA, then that that wine gets another fifteen dollars on top of it because they can market it. <laughs> that could be, could be true. If we get our own AVA named after our land, that would be insane. And what does uh, a wine what does a wine tasting cost there? Um, when you grow up, what do you get? Like a five to four or five or, or three? What's what's a wine tasting like? So we do. Um, I'm I'm Cheers, Peter. The price that we would do it's six dollars a or what do we do for? glasses versus tastings uh, maybe we can get kaylee to chime in well here i'll i'll, okay, I'll, so I'll, I'll drop you off for a second glass. kaylee hi hey <laughs> so it's i know it's been a long time since we've all been in the tasting room so i totally get that because my brain was kind of like wait what do we charge it's eight dollars for glass and it's fifteen dollars for four one ounce tastings uh if you join one of our wine clubs um you get to have complimentary tastings or glasses oh. of wine every time you visit so, oh, wow. That's worth oh. checking out on our website. And what's uh, the wine club cost? There's no entry fee. You just commit. To <laughs> yeah. It's a really, really great deal. I think we have some of our club members on with us, and they could probably speak okay. to it and comment. But um, you commit to purchasing for our top club. You purchase three bottles of wine every other month at 20% off the regular price. Um, so with that, you get... Um, complimentary food every time you come and you get complimentary tastings or glasses of wine two for you and two for a friend or Road trip. wow <laughs> that's a deal, yeah, it, that's a deal. Actually, it, in all seriousness like, you can do a really a really fun road trip with san diego wineries which oh totally to be, to be honest i i never would have thought of san diego wineries as being anything just get a that driver I would, that I would, but, uh, clearly clearly have a driver because party bus that's a club specialty that. Um, okay, <laughs> well, you know, we're wine club members up at um, up at Vulcan Mountain, and they do amazing stuff up there at, at what, what's Vulcan Mountain like five thousand, four thousand uh, feet, and they've got some uh, really good stuff up there. But then you guys have this, and it's completely different not not that far, less than an hour away from each other. And uh, I'm sure there's other great wineries in San Diego that uh, I just don't know about yet. There's so many that you can visit in the San Pasqual Valley and Ramona. Um, I think that it's worth making a trip and visiting all of us because we're all friends there. We all want to elevate the whole valley and make it a destination for all of San Diego and get people to know it better. So come visit us. Come visit all of our, our partner neighbor wineries all around the valley. Um, you can just Google it and find out what they all are. They're all fantastic. Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to make the decision right now because I have actually a limo company that, that contacts me every six months or so. Nice. Actually, they haven't contacted me in about eight months because of <laughs> COVID, but uh, they're not really a big market for tasting parties right now. But um, um, let's let's just do a blogger. Let they get a big, big van and go to you know three or four different wineries and, uh, you know, just really blow stuff up as being like, hey, you know, you don't need to go to Napa or Sonoma or uh, you know, wherever. There, there's some great opportunities right here in San Diego. So well, if you guys I, are done with that, let's let's make that happen. I was just going to say that, like, I, I feel like um, it's terribly underrated. And I think I agree. We're, we're, we're not doing, I mean, I'm so glad we did this because I was one of those people that was like, James, really? Really? See, I was <laughs> trying not to out anybody, but you guys just. Uh... <laughs> no, I, I was. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I, he vouched for you and I trusted him and he was absolutely right. And, um, you know, I, I'm even dubious of Temecula. So it's like, you know, this this is really impressive um, and you deserve the kudos. So I'm really glad we're doing this. So cheers to Kaylee. Cheers to uh, to Adam. Cheers to uh, all the other people that I'm probably forgetting the names of right now <laughs> that are... Uh, Alice Bailey, Chris Vermel, all of the farmers, all the workers on the ranch. It's mm. all, it's a village and it's a lot of amazing people and we want to keep growing and sharing with all of you. Kayla, here's Cheers. a bizarre question. I know a Thank couple you. places in LA have like animals and zebras and crazy stuff on their lands. There's one in Malibu. I can't remember the name of right now. Do you have stuff? Do you have, you know, what kind of uh, know, wildlife do you have out there? On the, <laughs> I, I, I think ranch, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, you know, stuff like that. Well, there's some cats. And it's not <laughs> okay. a pet. Okay. Plenty okay. of those. We've got mountain lions, bobcats, wild turkey, deer, like you could not believe, just just herds of deer. They're very happy. We don't hunt there. Um, we don't allow hunting, I should say. <laughs> we don't allow hunting. Some people well, make good. it way on, unfortunately. Um, but it's just, it's a haven for all kinds of wildlife, birds, uh, 
on top of the cattle. I mean, the deer are so fat and happy because they're they're enjoying the vitamins and things that they put out for the cattle. <laughs> and um, they share the space next to the wild animal park, going into the uh, ring, or La Jolla Indian Reservation on the backside. Mm -hmm. We even have a badger. Um, oh, that's really? <laughs> so and, and it's just so historic. I mean, the land, most of it looks the way it did, not just 175 years ago, it looks the way it did back when the Kumeyaay were inhabiting it and, and grinding acorns in their matates. And we have the evidence of that in their pottery. And we even have pictograms of, of that on some of the rocks. So it's really special. And then I'm can you tell me a little I'm bit more about your family friendly um, aspects? Just because I, I help a lot of families plan trips here and stuff. And they all go to the safari park, it seems like these days. Um, so it could be a little side excursion, you know, for mom and dad to unwind at the end of the day. Lions and tigers are more than mine. <laughs> you would not be the first mom with that idea or dad with that idea. Um, we, we have plenty of customers who see our signs we put out and they go, oh, we were going to the wild animal park or safari park. And mm -hmm. uh, we saw these signs for wine tasting, so here we are. Um, we Before we shut down with COVID-19, we had a bounce house for kids every Sunday on the opposite side of the tasting area to kind of give kids that a works in the tasting room. We do the hayride tours, which are absolutely just loved by all of the kids, and they love the live music. And then we were also partnering with San Diego Pop-Up Playdate. Um, every second Sunday, we were having hours earlier in the day when we opened, I believe it was 11 to 1 or 2 we were doing, where they would set up activities and have like fun kids musicians and all kinds of things come to entertain the kids so mom and dad could maybe have a couple glasses of wine. Um, yeah. It's, cool. So we are all about family, familia, all of that, just like the tradition of the, the, the heritage, the Mexican heritage of Ranch. And That's Kaylee, very cool. Uh, Stacy just added a really long comment that, that covers up your your faces when I put it up there, but <laughs> she said she'd love to see a video of your property. She said she looked at the site and would love to see more. Uh, so uh, do you have any videos? Uh, do you have a YouTube channel? We don't have a YouTube channel yet, um, but there are definitely some videos on our Instagram and Facebook, and um, I could post some more things if people would be interested in seeing mm -hmm. More of the ranch. I know that we have some some pictures of a, a cattle drive out on the ranch. Um, if you scroll back a ways, but I, I might just make a post that has um, sort of the sights and sounds and scenery of the ranch for you guys if you're interested in that. And, and I know you've you've talked about kids, and and obviously I'm well. I guess Kevin and I have the, the oddballs here who don't have kids. Dogs but, too. Uh, and you, you too. You too. Dogs, dogs too. We, we oh, accept dogs. Oh, I love dogs. I'm not much of a cat guy, but love dogs. Sadly, okay. I don't have a dog anymore. Okay. But uh, any, <laughs> but what I what I also wanted to throw out there is the fact that you guys have some awesome, awesome high end opportunities too. Like you actually have a helicopter that you use to survey the uh, property and take people to different um, the different remote vineyards. I think that's just really cool to be able to do kind of a surprise date where you're going to have a wine tasting that you have to take a helicopter oh. to. Like that. That's just like mind blowingly awesome, and, it, and it, when we were talking, the price really wasn't that expensive. It sounded like uh, it's not. It's not a thing we're doing right now. It's something we were toying with, and we'll probably bring back in the future. But it was um, select days throughout the year where we would charter our helicopter to um, come and and bring guests up to a very remote location for a tasting with like a an acoustic musician, like a cello player or a guitarist. And because we do it all on the same day, we could kind of share the chartering cost. And um, I can't remember what it was, it was a while ago, but I think it was like 350 bucks. Yeah. What? <laughs> that's so oh, that's cheap. So good. But you like had that, that's to a, That's a totally baller day. date idea. Not, we're not yeah. doing yeah. that. That's, that's a great date. Yeah, hopefully we can bring it back. And we're working on building our permanent tasting room right now. We're just an outdoor space, which is beautiful with gardens and everything, but there's a lot of growing happening. We're building, um, hidden inside of one of our vineyards, we are going to have a concert venue that we're putting in with a huge stage to have like- I was, gonna ask, if you, I was gonna ask if you have musicians or live music during, uh, you know, what's- And what is the open date again for the tasting room? The 27th is what we're projecting right now, as long as we can get everything in place to fit COVID regulations. Okay. This can't happen and, soon enough. And, and don't <laughs> no. worry, Adam, we haven't forgotten about you. I see Adam down in the, in the little screen down below, kind of. <laughs> so with with that, uh, 
Um, I'm going to drop you back out and bring Adam back on, but Perfect. it was awesome. I really, really want to go up to the ranch and, and explore because it just seems like everything you say can't possibly be real, but you've shown me so many pictures at this point that <laughs> that it, it is real. And I'm it's not just, that good it, in Photoshop, so yeah, it's real. <laughs> it's real. Well, I, I love your idea of getting in a limo and doing a uh, San Diego Bloggers uh, winery road trip. I thought that, uh, that's a great idea. I'm in. I'm in too. I'm in. Totally. Cool. And Adam, are, the most important thing, are you in? Are you going to be able to lead our uh, our tasting around San Diego County drinking wine and not have to drive? It, it would be my <laughs> Absolutely. I know that was a really hard sell, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to think about it for a while, you know, a while but uh, I ultimately thought. I, I mean, we, we can so help. I know we can. We, I know we kind of interrupted your uh, the tasting of the uh, the Merlot because we're all just I think really really impressed by it. That's fine. Uh, it, I was pretty through with it at this point. I mean, it, it, we <laughs> talked about some of the, the different flavors going on with it. I think it pairs really well with that rustic red cheese. But I actually oh, yeah. really really great with the third one, the Schnabelhorn. Um, but yeah, I, I, as far as like this wine, I think is. is it's a younger wine. I think this wine drinks really, really nicely now and is pretty generous now, but I think with some time, this wine will become something even more complex. Well, it's, 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 all, gra it's all great. And, um, Any favorite? Uh, my favorite is the Claret. That's going back to uh, you know what was said before, and James is kind enough to share with me. And again, it's got that James Bond sophistication to it. Matter of fact, Right after we had the Claret before, Diamonds of Forever came on. And the very end scene was James Bond on the uh, cruise ship and the evil guys are trying to kill him. And he, he says, wow, I would expect with this meal, you would have a Claret. Well, I didn't even know what a Claret was the first time I watched that movie. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, it's like, excuse me, but uh, our Claret cellar is rather poorly stocked. You know, but then I could relate to it. I was like, hey, I just had a Claret. So that's my favorite. <laughs> and, you know, they, you guys also have some really, some other ones that I really appreciate the fact that you're doing, even though I know, don't know that I would buy a whole bottle of it. Like the Peak Pool, for instance, is, is a phenomenal uh, ex exploration. Right. That one, uh, that resembles a sour beer even more so than, than this Rockwood Blanc. So that one that's, has the same, uh, I believe it still has a lot of skin contact and has some color to it. And it just has a bit more of that beer yeast sort of flavor. I love that. But for me, that's more of a pairing one. That's you need something to, to marry up with those flavors. And then it's truly phenomenal. But um, yeah, I, I, I can see what you mean there. I think where we really thrive is with these provincial Rhone style varietals from France. So the, the, the Mavedra, Grenache, Syrah, those, those are the, the grapes so far for me in the short time that I've been eating these wines and experimenting with these wines that have just completely taken me back. And I, even just talking with Chris, I, I think his passion is, is in the right area. He makes incredible, incredible Syrah. Um, but I, I, talking with him he loves working with grenache and i feel your, like your grenache blanc was something i have i don't i don't see very very often but it was actually pretty good too incredibly good another one with with the nod to the old world a little bit more earthy flinty kind of kind of limestone like flavors coming out of that wine i love that wine um but but it, one thing that we just can't even keep in stock is his syrah but I think that hmm. with the next vintage and the coming vintages of his Grenache, that people are going to start to see what what Chris can do with Grenache, um, because a lot of these, a lot of this stuff is from many many vintages ago, and everyone learns tricks and different things hmm. with every vintage and everything they have under their belt from prior experience. They take that with them in the next vintage, and I, I've seen that uh, with with every different vintage going forward with these wines that there has been more and more uh, just just incredible flavors coming out of each one of them. I, I think they've gained in polish and just are really getting better and better. But that once once you get the opportunity to taste some of the Syrah and the Grenache, I highly recommend doing that, uh, along with the Claret. And um, the Tourette Noir actually is another, another varietal that, they, that we play with, uh, which is traditionally a blending grape in Chateauneuf-de-Pop in Southern Rhone. 
and I've never seen it done as a single varietal before. I, although I'm talking with them, I guess some other people are doing it. But um, it's it's so good. It is absolutely phenomenal. It even tastes somewhat like an Italian wine. So it, it, it really like transcends the old world, new world thing like a lot of his wines do. I, I think he does an incredible job of doing that. And so far, being in California, in this region specifically, I, I haven't had anybody's wine that really can do that. So it's but pretty special. You mentioned the components of a GSM. Do you guys yep. have a GSM, or are you? So yeah, we, we do Grenache Sarama Vedra blend. Sometimes it's blended with some other varietals as well. But we, we do play around with those and like just specifically Mavedra Syrah, Mavedra Grenache. There there have been a lot of different blends that I've seen that they do. But yes, absolutely, we do we do those blends. Cool. Excellent. Well, I'm I am really impressed. And uh, you know, rather than kind of letting this uh, just keep wandering on, which I could, I could talk with you guys and drink wine for the next like five hours, but I'll keep going until uh, I see whatever you want to do. Uh, in, <laughs> unless, in, unless anybody has anything else, I think I'd kind of just wrap it up and uh, you know, keep it. Uh, I'm really excited to go. Um, Same. And, and it's like it's, you've you've taught me a lot. I really really appreciate it, Adam. Um, for I mean. A, a ton of stuff and again like i said i don't know shit so this is me starting at ground zero and it's really wonderful to learn the terminology but also just how to tell the difference um between good and less than good um and this was delicious so i i'm looking forward to visiting and tasting more but also just seeing the property and knowing that it's in san diego it makes me want to support you even more Agree. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I've been going down to Valle de Guadalupe in Baja for quite a while. And I honestly didn't know that there were quality wines like this in San Diego, right in our backyard. And I'm really excited to not only visit your location, but explore more of what San Diego has to Absolutely. offer. So it's really exciting for me. Agree. I am thrilled that, that I'm a part of this. And <clears throat> interested and I, I really really look forward to welcoming you all and and sitting you down and just having some wine together and chit-chatting and enjoying the the space it's really just it, it impossibly beautiful when you're there so i'll be, we'll be picking you up in that limo soon absolutely <laughs> two weeks from tomorrow adam i'm going to drop you out and i'm going to give uh, kaylee the last word unless you have something you wanted to uh well, leave I us just, with i just want to raise a glass and thank everybody involved thank rancho cajito thank Kaylee for organizing everything, everybody involved here and everybody who's watching and, and chiming in, Chris for making these fantastic wines with Alicia, especially thank you, Alicia, for chiming in and helping me out as well. Yep. Uh, this this has been really an honor for me. It's the first time I've ever done anything like this. So uh it, it well, you did great. Really, really awesome. Mm -hmm. So thank thank you. And, and the cheese Cheers. is awesome. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Benissimo yes. did a great so job good. with the cheese pairing. Uh, class race to Benissimo. Again. Yes. Mm. Uh, th thank you all yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, Kaylee, I'm going to bring you in, and uh, I'll let you have the last word. No pressure. Last word. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just really grateful that all of you wanted to join us and try the wines that um, are being produced right here in San Diego, like we talked about. We've got so many great winemakers out there, and and just even just vineyards whether they're making their own wine or not. There's a lot of wine growers and there's a lot of fun things to come from this region. Um, definitely check out our website, check out the case sale while we still have it. It's keeping our bar staff paid and our musicians paid um, while we're closed, which is fantastic. I'm in on that. Mm -hmm. And we're not trying to make a profit at all. We just really care about the people who care about us and work hard for us and we want to continue to do so. So June 27th, everyone please mark your calendars. Can't wait to see all of our club members again and all of the new faces. Thank you so much. Have a great